Hi, Dallas. Thank you so much for joining us on Speak as a Leader. I am so excited to talk to you. Thanks, Ian. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. I've been reading your posts and following uh, you and your advice, and yes, I'm excited. So kind of you. I, I I love interacting with you online, and I think this this way when we connect the offline and the actually it's not really even offline because I'm not with you in the same room, but connecting the the experience of connecting with someone on a platform versus connecting one on one is just is just incredible. Let's get started. I would love for you to do an introduction and tell us who Dallas is and a little bit about your story so far. I know you've had an incredible journey. I know all about it and I would love our audience to know as well. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, So my name is Dallas Kostna. I'm located in Winnipeg, which is in the center of Canada. Uh, We like to call it the Great White North. We heard about uh, that, but uh, so I have an amazing wife, two uh, awesome children, and I say children in air quotes because they're both in university. Uh, I was uh, an entrepreneur before I graduated from university. I started my first company when I was 13 years old, uh, doing uh, computer software at that point in time, and uh, I've been in executive roles since the early 2000s. And I'm currently the SVP of operations at Keener Jerseys. It's amazing. You've had the opposite life journey from me because when I was younger, I had no idea what entrepreneurship was like. I was never really attracted to it. I always thought I would go work for someone in an office and be this executive, this important person in a team, you know, coordinating things and signing documents like That was my weird little corporate dream when I was 10. So I love that you started entrepreneurship at a really young age. And then you had this, what I would call very unconventional uh, journey of doing entrepreneurship for a long period of time, a significant period of time, and then going back into the world of working for other people, but still being entrepreneurial in that role. So how did you find this transition of, you know, going from being an entrepreneur to uh, being in, in, in a world where you might not have so much control over everything that's going on? Right. And, and I remember when I, I first started, uh, I, I tried to bring a piece of myself, uh, several, in fact, uh, with me. So I brought my own computer and, and the people there thought, well, and I brought my own desk. Why is he bringing his own computer and his own desk? So I want to have that that transition. And now that I look back at it, uh, more comfortable and seamless for me. And I was very fortunate. I worked for a, a company of around 50 people. The uh, CEO, the chairman, uh, they're, they're entrepreneurs. And they were my mentors as well and helped me to, at a young age, thrive uh, and embrace the fact that I was an entrepreneur. They, they actually liked that and they would give me uh, probably a little bit more rope than, you know, latitude than, than others would have in that situation. Mm. And during the, um, the course of your entrepreneurship, you were, tell me a little bit more about like the kind of teams you were leading. Uh, were you also a, a manager and a leader during that time? When I was an entrepreneur, uh, when I first started off, I'd I'd have uh, friends, uh, partners. So, and they were all small enterprises where I'd have probably, you know, between three and five, six people involved. Uh, So it didn't get to like a large company. Regardless, though, I'd always have that that leadership and uh, coaching aspect. I just didn't know it at the time. You know, I, I just grew up thinking oh I'm the president and you know I get it, it was more of the that is being a fashion type statement than what I know now is what it means to be a leader yeah I know I know what you mean especially when we're entrepreneurs because I come from a world where I was a, a startup co-founder for a little while you do it's it's kind of a weird balance between feeling like yeah cool i'm my own boss and i get to like dictate what happens and at the same time not having enough systems in place because you're not an established company with an established 
culture or an HR department. So you don't have the right systems in place to make sure that the the people in your team feel valued so that you know that um, the people in your team have the right communication system set up. It's kind of like all on you. And if you're not trained or if you don't have the right mindset to be a leader in that scenario, then ultimately the resources or your partners or your employees might suffer. It's, it's definitely happened to me. I've, I've learned the hard way. Um, when I was in the corporate world, I always thought I'm going to be a great manager one way and I, one day. And I, I love the idea of, of having people that reported into me. I left the corporate job before that happened. And then when I became an entrepreneur, then I had just like you had like a network of, of resources, partners, freelancers, um, part-time, and then eventually full-time team members working with me. And I really think I was a terrible boss. That's, that's one of the reasons why I, I now teach, um, train and coach leadership communications, because I really think I've been through the worst of it. I've been through that, that phase of, thinking that I'm doing great and actually doing incredibly poorly. <laughs> so I don't know if you've, if you've had that feeling. So did you ever have this, um, what I like calling a, a switch flip moment where you feel like the, the switch has flipped from you being a manager or a boss to being a leader? Yeah, exactly. I, I remember when I was promoted from being a manager to a VP for the first time. And, you know, when I was a manager, I was always thinking that would be the path. And one day I'm going to be VP. And it's like, well, what, what does that even mean? So, uh, you know, for the first while, I continued to orchestrate my staff. I look at it that way. It's your, your, you know, not that you're like a master of puppets, but you're, you're still, uh, you know, the conductor of an orchestra, not as much in a, a leader and enabler. Uh, of of people, uh, so one day that the chairperson, who was my mentor, said to me, "You're a VP now. Act like it." Uh, he was very stern, a bit old school, and spoke his mind. But he was right. Uh, and from then onward, I took it upon myself to really study what being a leader was and what I needed to do. So, what is being a leader? And if you were to kind of tell me maybe the top three things that you learned at that time that you've carried with you, what would those be connected to being a leader? Right. Uh, what I've learned is that uh, there are three things required to be a leader and that the three main jobs of a leader, that's to invite, include, and inspire. You can have the greatest ideas in the world, a strong vision, but if you don't bring people along and, and into the conversation, they don't buy in. It's a fundamental part of change management that you want to have people uh, participate, but you need to bring them into that conversation. And it's not just inviting them and bringing them in. It's like truly including them in decisions, uh, valuing their opinions. And then inspiration is so important because you've got that vision. You've, you've uh, in your mind, most entrepreneurs, they can see, oh, this is what we need to do. This is where we need to go. But no one else knows. So how do you inspire them? Uh, you know, the quiet quitting is something, uh, a term that's that's come up a lot lately, mm. where people only want to do the minimum. You're paying them a, a wage or a salary. Why would they want to do anything more for you? And that's where inspiration is really important. So those people say, I can't wait to help you build this because I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to see it grow. I'll be able to have part of my name on it and stake a claim on, on the, their role in achieving it. That's amazing. I love I love this framework and invite, include, and inspire. It's kind of like the three eyes, but they're they're all about the you. They're all about the employee, the team member, the person that you need to be inviting, including, and inspiring. And for me, one of the things that I'm passionate about is communication. And I love that communication for me, at least the way I'm seeing it is kind of the linchpin. It's it's at the, you know, it's the cornerstone of, of all these three things, because if a leader doesn't really know how to communicate with their team, they're not going to be able to invite, include or inspire them in the right way. They're not going to know what kind of language to use, how to adapt what they're saying to the person that they're speaking with, how to listen effectively, how to bring that feeling of, of inspiration and inclusion with the words that they're saying. 
how did you work on your communication skills? It's something that I'm I'm very interested in knowing. I feel like I can imagine you as a leader and I feel like I can imagine you speaking very effectively and, and with impact. So I'd love to know if communication skills was something that you focused on. Yeah, well, thanks for, for saying that. I appreciate it. And very early on, I was an introvert and still still am uh and and communication wasn't really my my strong suit or wasn't something i really focused on then i joined a debate team in uh, grade seven grade seven grade eight and that really kind of got me out of my shell in a contained way like in a certain uh atmosphere you know these, these groups of uh, of people I was still shy, but then when I was on stage, as it were, then then I'd be able to talk. The most important part of that development, though, is I realized one day in high school, uh, when I was in my last year of high school, deciding what I was going to do, oh, I should be a teacher. I, and I had always terrorized my teachers, right? So it was very ironic that uh, I wanted to do that. Uh, halfway through my degree, my uh, so through this education degree, I had started my entrepreneurial uh, endeavors and was going to drop out. And my uh, girlfriend, wife now, uh, said to me, nope, you're finishing your degree. You're going to get your your education degree. It's really going to help you with your communication skills. And of course, she was absolutely right. So I think that's what set me on that path. That's incredible. The fact that you you sought it out as a skill, despite you saying that you weren't entirely comfortable with it, and if you've been an, an introvert most of your life, that means that you probably at different points, maybe even now, have to consciously step into that role where you might not be an introvert anymore, where you're being outspoken by design, where you're being the person that people are listening to and looking up to. Is that still uncomfortable for you or now you're really at ease with making that transition depends on the situation and the environment you know at work uh it's it's very natural to me when i've seen like i I have some social anxiety too in those situations i really have to work on get out of that shell thankfully when i've pushed myself to do it then I start to realize, oh, this is really good. I'm having some cool experiences interacting with, with people. And then it just kind of uh, snowballs in a positive way. Hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. So would you say that there are parts of you that you showcase and highlight when you're speaking as a leader? So did you at any point kind of create this leadership persona that you can then use to speak as a leader? Yes, and one of the things that I really wanted to do in terms of a, a persona was, since a young age, uh, was to use humor. Because mm-hmm. I found that that's, you know, not that I'm doing stand-up comedy, but I found it's a way to disarm people uh, in, on, in situations that might be potentially explosive, uh, to reduce stress of those people uh, in, in uh, a situation. Like, for example, today we had a very large project that we had to release and it was very intense a lot of work that had to be done it's stressful so you know having a, a dad joke here or there uh, you know or commenting uh, about the situation it just relaxes people so they feel more comfortable and ends up uh, that they're more effective so that was that was a part of it on one hand and then on the other hand being able to understand when you have to be very serious it's kind of a dichotomy there there, there's sometimes where okay, now we're not playing around. This is what needs to be done, and why? I think that's a big part of it is explaining the why. Mm-hmm. All of that makes so much sense. Using humor effectively in the workplace is definitely a skill and an art. And I know there are actually a lot of um, coaches and trainers that specialize in that. I, I don't know if you're if you ever come across the work of Andrew Tarvin. Um, he's a self-proclaimed humor engineer. If I hope I'm getting that right. It's, it's, it's incredible. The work that he's doing is exactly focused on this training teams and leaders to use humor effectively at work. And just like you said, it's not about being a stand-up comedian. It's not about making joke after joke, but it's about lightening the mood. It's about really creating that sense of camaraderie through humor and also 
enabling people not to take things that seriously. And it's it's interesting what you mentioned about like the switch, the that dichotomy that happens. And I think this is inevitable, really. Do you ever watch New Amsterdam? No, no. Okay, it's a, a series about this this hospital and a lot of um, you know medical humor slash drama going on. And there's this surgeon in there who is generally really funny and open and inviting person. And he has this new intern who then kind of oversteps a boundary in the the during surgery in the operation theater. And he because the intern feels so empowered by the boss's attitude outside of the operation theater, he thinks that anything he says will be taken into consideration no matter what the situation is. So in the operation theater, the surgeon's giving him these orders of like, you know, let's I'm going to do this. So please help me with that. And the intern is kind of like opposing that and giving different arguments and the surgeon doesn't take it too well. So he finishes the surgery. And then afterwards he says, you know, outside of the operation theater, I'm open. I'm your friend. I'm your teammate. I'm your confidant. I'm your mentor. I will always welcome your ideas. In the operation theater, I'm going to be a dictator because that's how it's going to work because there's something larger than both of us at stake and it's not going to be democratic. And it was really interesting because that really spoke to me. And at the time I was doing filmmaking and I noticed this dichotomy in me because I was, at least I think I was quite nice and open and friendly and really open to people's points of view and differing opinions outside of the film shoot. But on set, when the stakes are high, when the, the time there's a timeline crunch, when there's a lot riding on these 12 or 14 hours that they're gonna, we're going to be shooting, I'm not democratic. I can't be. So it really is, is very interesting that that dichotomy that you're speaking of did you ever notice people taking that the wrong way? Did you ever feel that people kind of um, didn't feel understood or did, felt like they were, um, I don't know, being steamrolled when you when you kind of made that switch from being the, the lighthearted Dallas to the more serious Dallas? Definitely. And I think that's why it's important to set ground rules and, and something that, you know, I forget, of course, from time to time. But the more you can do that in advance and, and let people know, okay, there's going to be time, there going to be times where, uh, you know, we'll be able to joke around, as you mentioned your example in New Amsterdam. There are times where uh, we're in the operation, operational theater, things are getting done and, and it needs to be perfect that, you know, I'm not going to be nice. It's, or I mean, nice is not the right word, but I'm going to be firm and fair, right? And it's going to be more to the point. Uh, and I do tend to keep uh, to catch people off guard occasionally uh, because, it's like, well, where did that come from? Why are you all of a sudden you are you that serious when things are going well? And that, that's a challenge for a leader too, because you're not there to be their friend, but you want to be friendly, and and you want to help coach and mentor them. I think what's important is that when you're coaching or mentoring someone, there are times where being too nice to them is the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to be firm. That makes a lot of sense. You're not there to be their friend, but you are there to be friendly and kind and respectful. I, I, I would say those are probably the things that you carry with you in different situations, no matter what the, the situation is. And I, I really feel like this is where a lot of, people that I know or people that I've seen, observed or read about that have not perhaps made that transition from being a boss to a leader really kind of misstep and falter where they don't really get that balance right. I feel like a lot of times the moment you switch and you get into a zone of being either serious or critical, you're a lot of people lose that that aspect of still being respectful, still being kind, still being empathetic. For me, now that I'm doing coaching on this formally, I'm not, I don't think that being empathetic and being 
critical or mutually exclusive. You can absolutely do both. And it seems like that's what you're uh, saying and, and, and striving for as well. But I, I really don't think that that is straightforward for a lot of people. Exactly. And, and when it comes to that's something I've really been working on the last several years is my EQ. IQ, I, I you know, uh, part of my ego, uh, I don't feel I've, there's always new things to learn, but that's that's not been the struggle. It's it's the EQ part and how, for example, to, you know, if you're going to be critical of someone, make sure you do it in private. Yes. Right. And, and if you're going to celebrate someone, do that in public. There are times where people, I, I did that last week, uh, said uh, this person did a great job hey they're the first to get this done and and they were just like went white as a sheet and hid and okay gotta be careful about that too this is really um, interesting this is exactly what um what some of the feedback that i got when i did, made a linkedin post about exactly the same thing like praise in public and criticize in private and i got people saying well don't always praise in public know your audience know your team member they might not actually appreciate you praising them in public and it's it's weird like you said it's very counterintuitive but that is absolutely the case with a lot of people yeah and i made a, this particular individual uh made an assumption because he's a stand-up comedian I'm great uh, at, at his job too uh <laughs> when he's doing his stand-up comedy and i thought well okay he's used to being in the spotlight but, but again it's in a different environment it's different than work uh, mm. When you're familiar with with people and, and you're comfortable, it's it's different. You know, you're around friends. But uh, this was people that he didn't know. He didn't he didn't like to have that type of praise. So now I've learned. <laughs> that is that is a great thing to learn to to really adapt what you're saying in different contexts with different people. I'm just curious, uh, now that you're, how, how big is the the team that you're leading now? About uh, 45 people. So with 45 people, do you, is it really easy? Well, I wouldn't, I'm sure it's not easy, but is it really possible to get to know all 45 people in depth to an extent where you're able to adapt your communication style depending on who you're talking to? It takes time. I think there's a lot of value in doing it. I also rely on uh, my team leaders because then I can ask them as well. They're a lot more familiar with the people that are on their team. And I can say, uh, you know, I'd like to recognize this person or this happened. Can you please talk to them? You, you get that additional context and information. That makes sense. That makes sense. And then you're um, eventually training the team leaders to be as personable and as connected to their teams as as you would like to be to them and then eventually to their teams as well. So it all it all works well if they're all getting the right training and in, they're in the right mindset. And it's great that you as part of senior management are setting that precedent that your, you know, your people come first and it's your, about your people. And once you're getting, once everything is in sync, as far as the communication with your people and the connection with your people is concerned, then hopefully business is going to be in sync with that as well. I try to lead by example, right? When, I, when I'm cheering people on, I'm hoping that, you know, without having to tell my, my team leaders, you should do this. this is, here's how you should recognize your people. Here's an example of how you could do it. Yeah. And that's great. That's 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 exactly what they they need to see. And you're right. If they're picking up the cues and emulating the same vibe and the same culture, then hopefully that is what is naturally happening. Now, I would love to to switch gears a little bit and talk about public speaking or speaking outside of your company. Have you sought out those opportunities in the past or now of of speaking externally, public speaking per se? Yes, uh, not at, at Keener or Jersey's yet, and mostly that's the time I've been there. It's, it's been uh, COVID, uh, but it's something I want to do again. It's something that I've done uh, in the past uh, roles in the company where I've been invited to speak at conferences and and, uh, and and that loved it. That's really great to hear. Do you do you remember the first time that you spoke on a stage, um, specifically professionally speaking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the first time I uh, spoke in a large auditorium and 
uh, it was the first time with with a microphone. I'd always gone on stage and, and uh, it was a small enough room where uh, and I was able to use my energy and, and just talk. Uh, uh, do you like the sound of your voice? I like the sound of your voice, but do you like the sound of your voice? <laughs> that is such a great question because it's the one thing that that you that you are not ready for. I think when you start hearing it back, because you realize this is completely different from how I actually sound in my head, because it is you, your your ears don't hear the voice the same way when it's coming out live versus how other people are hearing it. It's just that's just how we're all built. So. I don't know. It's a great question. I can't say I'm the hugest fan of it. No. Yeah. So what what had happened is I'm doing this speech and I heard my own voice and I heard a little bit of the delay, the echo, and, and that ended up throwing me off what I was what I was saying. So that that was uh, an interesting start. You get used to it, but that was an interesting start. Mm-hmm. And it's great what you mentioned about there being a mic. You are so right. It somehow changes the dynamic. It, it somehow really either throws people off or some people that are super used to a mic just can't speak without one. I've really seen this this huge difference just because of this one little device in their hands. It's it really is it's, it's very, very interesting to observe. So it's very interesting that you bring that up. It's almost like a tool that can sometimes even become a crutch for some people. Because if you're so used to it, if you, then you're not used to projecting your voice. You're not used to just being without it. You might you might feel naked. You might feel unprotected. I've seen this happen, for example, in stand-up comedy, which we're talking about a lot today uh, for some reason. Uh, and in stand-up, you're very used to there being a mic. And I remember being at a, at a, at a very small show where the mic just wasn't working. And there were people that actually went up on stage Everyone knew the mic wasn't working. They told us in the beginning that, sorry, we're going to project our voices. But there are some people that went up on stage with the mic that was not working. And they said, I'm so sorry. I'm going to hold this here anyway, because that's just how I practice my set. And that's how what I'm used to. You literally had two or three people just just holding the mic and delivering their jokes, knowing full well the mic wasn't working. It was was bizarre. Yeah, exactly. But it seems like you learned how to project your voice before that that's very interesting did you learn that specifically or did you just kind of get into it without training well there were there was some training involved when i was uh, it started when i was doing debate in in uh, this is in junior high school and learning about inflection and how uh, you know you can vary the power of your voice and use tone and pause things like that uh that I was able to learn and somehow became part of my repertoire without really purposely learning that and intentionally learning it. So uh, that's really helped me when it came time to do public speaking. It's so great that you brought that up and that we're talking about voice modulation because it really, you're, you're so right. Voice is such a huge tool in our toolkit that we never really, a lot of people never really think of as something that they need to really work on in terms of the yeah the variations in the voice like you said how to really use it effectively how to project it how to make it carry emotions make it portray different kinds of emotions it's is like genuinely one of, the, one of the top three things that I work on with anyone that I I, I work with because Somehow, one way or the other, they've, it just turns out, unless they've, <clears throat> like you said, unless they've done some kind of debate or if they've been a singer, if they've used their voice in a particular way, then they kind of understand. If they've done radio, for example, that's a good one. But unless they've happened to do those things, people just haven't trained their voices for, for decades and decades of their lives. So when they start speaking in public knowing how to modulate their voice, how to portray more excitement or more calmness, really going up and down with the inflections, it really does not come naturally. The thing I also find very weird is that in real life, we're all right with the inflections. They come very naturally. You ask a question, you you end, you, no one needs, 
like everyone understands when you're asking a question, even if you ask it in another language, you you really understand this person's asking you something just through their voice. So I always find that very interesting that these are skills that you kind of pick up in your one-to-one interpersonal communication, but the transition of that skill from one-to-one communication to public speaking is just not by they're happening by default. It's very astute. Uh, and and it's interesting that, you know, do you feel that people become, because it is a certain arena, they feel that they have to behave a certain way, uh, that there are different rules involved, or, or what, do you, what do you think contributes to that? I think that people get carried away with a huge emphasis on content. And a lot of times new presenters or inexperienced presenters will think that the PowerPoint is the god of that presentation or that meeting. And their only purpose is to deliver that PowerPoint. So I really think it's because they're so involved with the content and just being a conduit for this content to the people that are present, they just, it's it's hard for them to kind of get out of that mindset and focus on on the other things, on their delivery, on their gestures, and eventually their voice. It's really because they're just freaked out. I see a lot of people just just freaked out and stressed out about the content. I don't know if that's something that you've... Have you seen that when you've seen other people present? Oh, for sure. And, and I've been... One of the things I've been working on coaching uh, my staff, particularly the younger and, and less experienced staff, where when it comes to a presentation... They, they have a lot of words on the slides and then they read every word on the slide. It's, well, you know, par- PowerPoint, try try doing it, p- picture having nothing there or just use a mm-hmm. photograph. Uh, you know, that's how I've adopted my PowerPoint presentations. Just if you're going to show anything, keep it minimal because uh, people are there to hear you, not to read because they could have read that at home, <laughs> right? Yes, that is that is great advice. I I start there as well with a lot of people for sure. Make the slides are there as a tool. They're not the the document. Like really, if 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 you have your research that you've done, the idea is not to put your entire research on that PowerPoint. You're the person who's supposed to be talking about your research. The PowerPoint is just a tool to help you. There's just yeah. There's so much. So much that can be said about bad PowerPoints. When you did your TEDx talk, did you have a a, a PowerPoint or it was no. all okay? That's interesting. <laughs> I could have, I could have had one. Those, you know, they they have um, they do TEDx has very strict guidelines on what should be on the PowerPoint. So really, they they want like I think it's maybe they even give you a word limit on like no more than these many words literally like a sentence um, or something on each slide and keep it visual. You should own the copyright to the visuals and things like that. So that has very strict um, guidelines, but for sure they allow PowerPoints. And I, I wanted to give myself the extra challenge of not having a PowerPoint and not using a teleprompter and just memorizing everything that I was saying. Weirdly enough for me, it actually worked out because I felt like it's easy for me to to control the flow of what I'm saying if I don't have a PowerPoint to worry about. The PowerPoint creates a natural pause. And I think when you're delivering something informative, that helps because, all right, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, you know, let's say one fact or two or three facts or things I'm talking about per slide. So it's good to pause after that. And it makes sense to be like in those sizable chunks of digestible information. But if I'm talking about something personal, something that was a lived experience, having those extra pauses maybe kind of breaks the flow instead. That's at least how I was trying to work that out when I was trying to make that decision. No, that makes complete sense. As you're saying, it, I'm like, oh, yeah, would it break the flow? Yeah, and that's what you said. Yeah, that's. <laughs> That's awesome. Good. I'd love to do TEDx sometime. Uh, so I'm interested to hear your experience sometime. That's uh, yeah. that's one of the things 
one of the reasons why I wanted to connect. It's like, wow, look at all the stuff Nasheen's done. It's amazing. And beyond TEDx, it just, that was Thank great. You. That's very kind. If you were to do a TEDx, what would you do it on? I think I would uh, want to talk about one or two things. Uh, problem solving, which is fairly ubiquitous, but uh, you know how to make a positive change in the world. And it, I think there, there's so much time that we spend in our day to day. How do you get out of that and, and make a difference? You know, with with your life. So I mean, look at what what you've done, right? And uh, you know how how you're able to help people. <laughs> I remember in elementary school, it was like, oh, I don't want to do, can I go last? I don't want to speak, right? And if you can help people get beyond that, that's 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 a skill. That's a thrill. There you go. Thanks. It's, uh, it's that's very interesting as, as a topic. So problem solving. And it would be, it would be very fascinating to, to kind of see what it is that you're bringing to that. Like, what is the new thing? the thing that you think people don't talk about enough when it comes to problem solving that you've experienced, you've stumbled upon, you've discovered, or you've refined that can make for, for an interesting new angle on problem solving. And I don't know if you want to talk about that now or, but it'd yeah, be very well, interesting. we should do that. We should do mm -hmm. that sometime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool. I would, I would love to know more about that because that's really what uh, a great TEDx talk would be about, you know, really, really specific, very much based on your experience, your expertise, your specialization. There's a part of the TEDx speaker guide, which says, and it has like a very informal, like question answer kind of FAQ part where it says, do I need to be the expert in my field? And the answer is the expert? No. An expert? Yes. So... It's really when you're structuring the talk or you're formulating the topic for your TEDx talk, it's really about thinking, what is it that I can uniquely talk about based on my experience, specialization, based on things I'm interested in, things I've done research on. And I'm sure for you, I feel like problem solving in leadership, perhaps something of that sort. And I would... I would almost love to see uh, the the entrepreneurial angle in there because that's really so unique to your uh, professional experience and your life journey. Yeah, so that, those are some uh, great ideas there, and I think how how to bring in uh, you know the human aspect of, of problem solving and how to involve more people rather than trying to solve everything oneself, you know. To, the more that you can bring other people into the conversation and, and you're right, it dovetails into that invite, include and inspire. Right. So. Mm. Do you, this is really, really interesting. I, I love that problem solving and leadership communications are so closely connected because you're right. A lot of times it's not only the leader that feels alone in terms of thinking that he or she needs to solve the problems themselves but sometimes if the team is in a specific mindset, in a specific vibe, and sometimes a specific culture, and I'm thinking specifically about the Asian cultures, the team themselves, they expect the leader to have the answers or they expect their boss to have the answers. And I know and I'm very happy to know that it is very different in the U.S. and Canada and in Europe. But in Asia, there is very much this mindset of, OK, you're the boss. Please tell me what to do and I'll go do it or I'll mobilize these resources and we'll all get it done. So how would you strike that balance or how do you strike that balance between being the leader and yet when it comes to problem solving, being inclusive and hearing out different points of view? I'm really interested in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the first aspect is to set the ground rules uh, so that everybody understands uh, when it comes to certain decisions, certain types of problems, where's the expectation? Like, I need to do this because it's strategic and it uh, affects, you know, there could be millions of dollars or lots of people at stake versus, uh, you know, I want to delegate and elevate as much as possible. So I, I want uh, to develop staff so that 
for their own benefit and for the benefit of the company, they can do as much on their own, make decisions, solve problems, uh, so that I can work on even higher order, more challenging tasks, uh, and involve gradually involve them in that, so that you're constantly trying to bring everybody up in your organization. That makes a lot of sense. That eventually you don't want to be the firefighter. You don't want to be the person that people come to for for solutions to their problems because if you're stuck in that role, there's no way that you can focus on other strategic things. You're just always going to be the firefighter. Exactly. Yeah, I wrote about that in a LinkedIn post a few weeks ago, and it's uh, there's this book, and I'm going to forget off the top of my head, but it, it talks about monkeys and management. Every time your staff come to you with a problem and they leave it with you, it's like leaving a monkey in your office. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're eating a banana and, uh, you know, they're jumping around. Next person comes in, another monkey. By the end of the day, all you have all these monkeys jumping around. How are you supposed to get any work done when these, you know, there's monkeys on top of your head, you know, like picking things out of your hair. Uh, so you're not getting anything done. So it's, when someone comes to you with a problem, it's how do you ask the right questions? How do you empower them? Uh, how do you coach them and mentor them? They they come to you with a problem and here's a potential solution. And then eventually they'll just solve the problems on their own. Then there are no, no monkeys in your office. It's, it's like the, the 60 uh, minute uh, manager and the monkey or something like that is the book. Anyway, uh, so, you know, interesting analogy. Have you ever had monkeys in your office? <laughs> I've had so many monkeys in my office <laughs> just jumping all over the place. That is that is an amazing analogy. I'm not going to forget that <laughs> anytime soon. Thank you for that. It's it makes so much sense. And that is it's it's is the problem that is always going to be at the back of your head. You're always going to be thinking, "Okay, now I'm responsible for solving this problem. Okay, let me work on this. Let me let me figure this out. Let me get some resources." And yeah, it's the more the more monkeys you have, even if you have just the one, just one is is distracting enough. I I want to talk about the other side of it for a second because I also feel that counterintuitively, people or leaders that have this approach of don't come to me with problems, only come to me with solutions, are actually also not entirely creating a positive environment. Have you ever felt that way? For sure. Uh, particularly we haven't, you know, if you have staff that are new, staff you haven't had a discussion with about boundaries, uh, where are they intimidated to come to you? That could be a whole issue in itself. Uh, and do they know how, do they have they developed problem solving techniques? Have, have we as leaders helped our staff to learn here's how to use the five whys to get to the root cause or use a fishbone diagram or uh, how to work with other staff to solve problems, how to break a problem down into different steps. If you haven't done that, how are they supposed to come to you with a solution? Yeah, that is that is a, a great perspective on it. This is something that I've personally suffered through because I used to be that bad boss. I used to be the, the person that said, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. And you're so right. If you haven't invested in training your team to be at a stage where they can do effective problem solving, you're not doing your job and you're not actually making sure that they have the right tools to solve that problem. And eventually what's going to happen is they're not going to come to you with either. And that is the absolute worst case scenario where you're not even aware of red flags. Uh, you're not aware of problems till they become so huge that you're not able to solve them because People were just too scared, too intimidated to come to you if they didn't have a solution. I'm not going to tell Nasheen there's a problem. She's going to just ask me what's the solution, and I don't have it. So it makes it makes a lot of sense, and so much of it, like you said, is is really about investing in your team and investing in your in your people, knowing that that is the one thing that is going to pay off. It's it's really very inspiring to hear about that you know hear that a leader like you is doing that because it's really easy to pay lip service to that of course no one's going to argue if you say you know it's, it's great to have good communication skills it's great to invest in your people but a lot of people just you know the buck just stops there somehow 
I've seen. And that's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. they, people get stuck working in the business where th there's so much that they have to do themselves that it's, it, and I've fallen into that trap in the past too, where it's, I've got to do all these things, but why, it, if you invest, you spend time helping others, well, that comes back to you tenfold, right? So that the, the more that you empower your staff, the more that they have capabilities, more things get done, and the more that you can spend time focusing on higher order, higher value things that, yeah, it's, I think it's just a natural way to, I like, I like the concept of servant leadership. So how can I help serve others? Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And would you say that there is a specific communication style that goes with servant leadership? Definitely, with, you know, humility as much as possible, where you want to be empathetic, you don't want to go in with all the answers, you want to uh, be open, listen, you know, you, you've uh, talked a lot in your uh, LinkedIn post about how important it is to listen, to actively listen, uh, and the difference between uh, the podcast you had done, I guess, this past weekend about the uh, difference between hearing and listening, I found that to be fascinating, and yeah, there's there's a big difference. A lot of people don't don't consider that. So. Yeah, I I yeah I gotta say that's one of the things that you know I learned in my personal life where my husband always point used to point this out. He still does for sure from time to time because I have not mastered this at all. Where he would say, you know, you're you're hearing me. You're just like hearing these words. You're not actually listening. You're not here. You're not present with me. And I realized yeah, I'm just multitasking and I, 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 I'm I, just doing, like I'm just going through the motions and you do see that happening in the workplace. And if you see that happening with your leader, with your boss, with the person that you think should be giving you their undivided attention, that can be really demotivating. Mm -hmm. yeah, I found that sometimes, uh, you know, someone will come in and, and, uh, you know, to just get started right away, interrupt. And I asked them to just give me a second. And at first they're taking it back. It's like, well, I've come to you with this issue. Why, why, you know, let's get on with what I came here to say. And a big part of it is, hey, I want to finish what I'm doing. But more importantly, I want to make sure if I'm not giving them my undivided attention, they can just talk at me. But what's the point if you can come to my office if they're just talking at me? I want to be able to listen and hear and and ask questions, get them to think about it, start that training process coaching. You know. And that's that's a great practice. That's is really great to to not immediately switch from whatever you're doing and give the other person attention because then you're doing yourself a disservice. And again, you might you might still be thinking about what you were doing at the back of your head and thinking, like, I just need to get back to that. There's this email that I'm in the middle of. And just actively telling the person, proactively telling the person that, you know, I, I, I'm not able to give you attention right now, but I will in X number, X minutes or, you know, at this time, it's actually valuing their time even more, saying that I, I value you, I value you and what you have to say so much that I want to give you undivided attention. So that's a great practice. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I'm, I, I, really love the conversation we've had Dallas thank you for diving deep into your history and your experiences taking us all the way back to your elementary and middle school days and bringing us to the present time and even the future where hopefully you're going to be doing a TEDx talk sometime soon I would love to see that on a stage is there are there any words that you would like to leave us with in terms of speaking as a leader and how you would like people to interpret speak as a leader? I think it's something that you need to practice every day. You speak as a leader, whether you're in a, an official leadership role or not, you have that opportunity every single day. And the more that we can do those three things to invite, include, and inspire, uh, I, I think the further that you're going to get when it comes to public speaking or privately speaking, in a small team environment. I love that. Inviting, including, and inspiring. I'm, I'm definitely going to do more research on that and see how that you know works into the, the framework, specifically when it comes to public speaking. That's something I 
I, I always like making sure that people understand that public speaking, just because you're speaking on a stage, it doesn't mean that you have stopped having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with your audience. So I'm sure that inviting the audience, including them and inspiring them works in, in all those contexts that you talked about. So thank you so much for, for going through that and, and showing us that, that framework. Yeah. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, it's uh, probably been a great experience to learn more about you and uh, read, reading your posts. Uh, but you know, just just an energetic, uh, lively individual, uh, and and all that experience put together. It's just it's just fun. It's just been a fun time. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. This was incredibly fun for me as well. Thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing so much of your life with us. Really honored to have you here. Well, thank, thank you, you. Dallas. Thanks.